And if you want them signed or anything, just let me know. Or we'll just grab it one if you don't need to sign. Awesome, dude. Well, yeah, chuck, chuck in. Yeah, just chuck in. Yeah, get on your feet. Thank you very much. One of the other ones going to be showing a documentary as well. Yeah, I, was, I was caught the last one. Oh, oh, okay. Castle is coming. Everywhere, lots of street musicians without a care. I bind all my clothes and cut my hair and shave real clean. Now I don't feel so ill, so I've cut back my pills, feeling better every day. Don't want this feeling to go away. It reminds me of Mary Jane walking hand in hand in the rain, exploring endless fields of flowers and watching endless waves on pebbled beaches, propelled by unseen tidal power, sea spray on our faces and our wind blown hair, walking home on warm. From that moment, when I discovered punk, I knew there wasn't anything that I couldn't do. first two albums I bought were like uh, Hotter Than Hell by Kiss and Let There Be Rock by ACDC and I kind of I guess I liked that guitar kind of rock being at that age but um, the moment I first heard the Sex Pistols all that became completely redundant overnight. When I heard punk rock I just loved it, sang along for it, became a big strong part of my life and then I met Cameron in the pub one night and we both shared a common interest. Uh, it got me totally uh, wanted to seek out their first record, Nevermind the Bollocks. And the moment I actually purchased that album, you couldn't just walk in the shops and buy it. I actually had to place it on order and wait a couple of months. And when it finally came in, uh, I was pretty excited. And when I heard it, it was just the most, probably to this day, it's still my number one record I've ever heard. We used to input, get all their records. We used to get them from, um, well, I used to get mine from uh, Brisbane. We used to go down there and buy up records. So all you could do was listen to your records and shit and yeah, we formed our own band. I remember Richard coming in very excitedly one day saying to me he wanted to from now on be called Dirty Dick Smegma. And I basically said, well, no, mate, you've just found the name of the band. Why did I go towards punk music? Um, in the days I was struggling, anything was fair game. And I met Cameron and basically followed him into it. I think a big part of our crowd were all the people who worked at the local uh, meat works and the railways for some reason. Probably the, the Yobbos used to come and see us because uh, they liked a bit of punk rock and uh, we were the only thing to see that was punk rock in the town. We went in armed with a set list of potential song titles 
It just did it. No coordination, no practice, and strangely enough, not the worst show we ever did. And I think within five seconds, having looked at the videotape since, uh, Richard must have like dislocated his thumb or something. And uh, he's in agony and being carted off to accident and emergency. And we just thought that he'd got cold feet. I think we found it at the halfway point of, of the set. So we basically uh, played, I guess, for about 30, 45 minutes, completely without Richard. And then when he came back, we just did the whole set, which you gotta remember just consists of playing a bunch of noise to some song titles. We did it all again with Richard. The guy, I don't think they even fucking knew I'd left. <laughs> After he went up to the hospital to get his thumb put back, the drum throne I was sitting on collapsed and I fell over backwards and took the snare drum and floor tom with me. And everyone said, oh gee, that's good acting. It wasn't, it brought me throne broke. Well, the music was crap <laughs> because I wasn't into that sort of music at the time. Even though punk rock was happening in other places, they were the first band that I can recall being in Rockhampton. So everybody that you had spoken to said, who are these mother dickheads? You know, what are they, what are they doing? What are they about? And um, I just think that Rocky wasn't ready for that sort of thing. Yeah, I think it's a lot of attitude. Yeah, if you get the attitude right, you'll get the music right. I think that's pretty much, yeah, I, f I like that. I'll stick with that one. <laughs> They really wanted us to go up and play, supposedly, and, you know, kept saying, come on, but we need demo tapes, we need demo tapes. Smeg McGig in Townsville, the Mushroom Club. Remember that well. Just came up for this brainstorm of, oh, Richard, you know, because we'd played a couple of covers by Kodak Discord. So I thought, well, look, that's how we play it anyway. We'll just bung that on. And it kind of got a little bit infectious, and Richard goes, but that song's really great, why don't you put that on there too? Yeah, right. we'll put, look, we'll make it a four song thing. So we put TV into the pub on and three songs off the Kadic Discord record, sent it up to these geezers. Yeah, we played at a place called the Mushroom Club and it closed down very, very soon after we played that gig. And someone wrote in saying the band, like they were offended by our band for a start and which wasn't that bad. Done worse since that, believe me. And, uh, yeah, the place got closed down, which was a shame because it was a really good club. But um, maybe it was a sign. There were some other bands there running them up. Maybe it just wasn't their taste. We weren't. Surely one band from fucking Rockhampton doesn't go there and closes down a club. It was just a sloppy, average, pretty ordinary kind of show. At the end of the gig, the next morning, and the money was cut up, Cameron awards me with the grand sum of $50, which didn't even pay for the motel. So I ended up going up the hobby shop and I bought a model train with it. The main thing that I can remember about the Dirty Rotten Bastards is that they used to spit baked beans over the audience. A uh, song called Ingredients, whereas Richard would get a catering sized tin of baked beans and he would actually sing there off the mic, read all the ingredients off the side of it. The baked bean thing was just so impressionable, you know. <laughs> so, At the end of it then, uh, Richard would just then suddenly attack the first four rows or whatever, splashing baked beans around on everyone and um, getting a whole lot of angry punters. And being what they were, some of the punks would take umbrage at this and then grab the can off him and dump it on Richard's head. So Richard again looks like this slime monster with baked beans and stuff. And it was just, the mess was just, stage was just putrid by the stage. I used to do all them things in the band because we, no one really could play very well. Cameron could play, Robbie Shitface could play a little bit. Adam did learn to play the guitar quite, quite well. Uh, Mick didn't give a fuck, he was only in it from the chicks right from day one. We'd been out putting up flyers up around town about the week before and uh, I remember uh, 
a cop car pulled up saying, what are you guys doing? And Mick walked up really sweet to him and said, oh, well, fellas, if you're not doing anything next Saturday night, come along to this. And they drove off, and this is back in the J.B. Ockie Peterson police state era. And I said, right, Mick, we're lined up for a raid now. Loads of cop cars come, and me and Adam, the guitarist, ended up getting locked up. I don't think any other members got locked up. They're too smart. And at the time, I remember being really perplexed and going, what's, what's the big deal? You've got five kids just out of their teenage years playing music, a tiny little club to maybe 50 other kids. And I could, at the time, I just thought, what's it all about? Why this heavy-handed Gestapo Nazi kind of op oppression? Why, why this why clamp down on this? It wasn't until years later that I actually perceived they saw us all as this threat. They must have been shitting their pants that Smegma was in Rockhampton playing and attracting people. I still find it hard to think why it had to be clamped down like that. I still, all I can, all I can figure out is they saw it as a threat. Smegma has left a legacy. Um, just the feedback I've got over the years, obviously we're talking today, nearly 20 years on, yes, it has left a legacy. We'd already inspired other people to start playing music. We certainly were an influence on the Lethal Injections. We inspired a Townsville band called Noise. I think over the years we inspired lots of people. I remember meeting people in independent bands years later, you know, coming up to me and buying me beers and shaking my hand going, if it wasn't for you guys, we wouldn't be doing this now. And I don't know if that's true or not, but you kind of appreciate in that people respected the band that much. Well, hopefully it inspired some people to get off their ass and play some fucking music. That was a great band to be an apprentice in music in. But once you finish your apprenticeship, you just want to get the hell out. And I remember that night, we, Mick and I had kind of already thought, well, we've actually achieved probably everything we need to achieve with this. And, and we'd had a sort of pact that as soon as it wasn't fun, that's when we're going to chuck it in. I can't remember it anymore, but obviously we weren't getting on. I, don't, I really fucking couldn't tell you. But obviously we weren't getting on. <laughs> We decided to form the dog chairs, except the dog chairs were going to be way better. We were going to be, you know, tighter and faster and louder and just really more committed than like any of our previous bands had been. But the dog chairs, I mean, they did do quite a lot of gigs around Brisbane and they were quite, they were known, you know, and they had a bit of a reputation. But I heard a lot of good things and, uh, you know, apparently they could make quite a racket. <laughs> I mean, Dog Chairs was a completely different kettle of fish to Smegma for a start. We actually played really well. We played really fast and really tight and really well. And we wrote good songs. And we had melody in there among the furiousness. They were a pretty good band. They're pretty raucous, but they were a whole step up the ladder from Smegma. Like they were a whole lot more organised and sort of... They could actually all play a song together, which was quite an achievement. For once, Rocky could feel pretty comfy knowing it had produced a regional independent band that could stack up against anyone, basically. Which was good, you know, it's just wholehearted sort of punk rock, you know, uh, hardcore sort of stuff. Um, which I, you know, I can appreciate. They're great players and, yeah, I like it. There's a sort of a code, and they, you know, they were, they were good. It's ironic, we were better musicians in dog chairs, but I think Smegma had more of even the musical legacy because it was just so strikingly different and original. Uh, partly due to the fact <laughs> the band couldn't really play. <laughs> One, two, one, two, three, four. 